right, so next up we've got our weird hardware, hair, hardware panel, which is one of my favorite traditions of Fantastic Arcade. Um, so we've got returning to the hardware panel, Alan Watts and Andy Raitano. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to them, yes, very awesome. Uh, they're going to be talking about some of their hardware projects, which you can actually see here at Fantastic Arcade uh, on this floor, um, right outside the theater this way, and right outside the theater this way. And also, um, Alan's got a piece or two, two pieces, three pieces. down, three pieces, yeah. or downstairs in the arcade. Two yeah. downstairs in Barrel of Fun, one upstairs. Yeah. yeah. So um, we're going to hear about some of their projects, things that they're working on, and give you guys a chance to ask them all your burning hardware questions. <laughs> all right, so Alan, take it away. All right, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Alan Watts. I'm a uh, artist and software developer here in Austin. And you might have seen Eye of the Pyramid here before. It's been at Fantastic Arcade for, I don't know, a few years um, running, uh, along with Wormhole, Actualization Machine, and uh, Laser Pong and Up made an appearance last year. And um, so I had done Eye of the Pyramid back in 2014 or 2013 and showed it at Maker Faire and Fantastic Arcade and different events around town. And I constantly always was asked questions about if it was for sale, if it was, you know, if they could buy, a, buy one. And I always said no. And, you know, it was kind of my, I felt like it was kind of my baby. And I liked having it as kind of like the special piece that I could bring out, uh, you know, kind of on special occasions. And so I never really thought about uh, selling it. Um, I had a few, actually the uh, Tim League from here at the Alamo wanted to buy it um, a couple of years ago. And that kind of planted the seed that's like, okay, maybe there is a market, you know, for making, you know, these weird kind of uh, arcade machines uh, that kind of harken back to the old days of like the parlor games you see that, um, you know, from the early kind of 1920s and 1930s. So um, I, the, the original impetus for I, the Pyramid was actually um, for a friend's art gallery. He had a show that was just entitled Luck, and it was pretty open-ended. Uh, whatever you envisioned your, uh, it, what was luck to you, um, that was kind of, it was kind of an open call to whatever you wanted to do. And so a friend of mine, Chris Lyons, who is the CL of CLAW, I'm Alan Watts, in case that nobody knew that. Um, yeah, yeah. So we, uh, he had saw some of, he saw some of my LED work that I've been doing with Arduino stuff, and I was just starting to kind of get into that world of, um, programming microcontrollers and LEDs. And so he kind of came up with this initial idea. It was like, hey, we should make some kind of weird game for, you know, this luck theme. Uh, so we started to kind of think about, you know, some of these, these old parlor games um, that existed that were all these kind of handcrafted mechanical games, uh, you know, like the penny arcade games. So we just started to do a lot of research and you know, Googling about images and old parlor games. And, you know, we're trying to get some inspiration for uh, what we could do. You know, I know outside there's the, like the palm reader kind of thing. And, you know, some of these weird uh, old classic games where it's just like you put a penny in it, it does some kind of weird little show for you. Kind of like the very essence of games, you know, it's just kind of one, uh, there's one, uh, you know, thing you're trying to do and that's, that's it. Uh, so there's a few, you know, we just started to do some researching about, you know, they're always kind of like these really cool wood cases with this, you know, kind of back glass artwork that usually has some kind of backlight effects. And uh, so we started to kind of play around with an idea of kind of like a test your luck game. And this was kind of the, this was actually the first uh, pass that, that we had for Eye of the Pyramid. And it was called the, the Eye of Ra. And it was pretty pretty much the concept that exists today with Eye of the Pyramid, where it kind of like, you'd hit the button and it would kind of build up to the light show. And originally it just had this kind of uh, few LEDs up top that would do some kind of animated effect. So it started to do some prototyping of that idea with an Arduino, and um, this was kind of my first, you know, pretty serious Arduino project. So I was trying to learn a lot of the LED programming kind of stuff, and then sound programming with the Arduino, um, and then found this uh, uh, pyramid at Goodwill, and it was a paperweight, you know, with the kind of in, embedded artwork at the bottom of it uh, with like the little felt bottom. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. What if I can, I could drill a hole in the bottom and put an LED in? And that kind of started this whole idea of a pyramid. It's like, oh, wait, maybe we should make this, you know, I the pyramid. And so we changed the name and started to kind of refine, you know, the whole look of it and still had a lot of the LEDs at the bottom and then kind of a more minimal light show up top. And then we eventually uh, came to the, this is the final design of it, of the, um, 
of the original where, you know, we was like, well, we want to have it kind of a more of a light show when you do win. So to make it a bigger payoff instead of just, uh, you know, kind of just you spent all this time because it ended up when we were kind of just uh, beta testing the prototype one in a hundred actually took a long time, which I'm sure if you've played it, it can be frustrating. So like, well, we got to make the payoff a lot bigger than just this minimal light show. So we ended up kind of adding more lights to the top and uh, making the, you know, kind of like build up, you know, kind of minimal, but just enough to kind of give you that, uh, that desire to keep playing it, which it definitely uh, kind of taps into that, very much the gambling aspect of humans and want to see, you know, it's like you see the lights are there and they're not lighting up yet, but, you know, it kind of draws you to uh, keep trying. So the process of building the first one was, uh, so this is, yeah, so this is, step back, this is the original prototype uh, version of building it. And so it was, you know, very manual. Um, so I built these templates that I, for my drill holes, because I was going to hand drill all the holes for the 100 LEDs, and it was just on plexiglass that I was going to airbrush um, uh, for the original one. So this is an 18 by 24 inch piece of Lexan, and uh, kind of taped up all these templates that I have of all my drill holes, and then spent like three hours just, you know, hand drilling all these holes. And I was, uh, my drill press that I wanted to do all the holes with didn't have enough throat to kind of do all the holes. So I found this older drill press and made this kind of jig to hold it upside down so I could, uh, that's kind of hard to see this picture, but so was, I was able to just kind of turn the drill press upside down, mount it on these beams, and then the whole drill luckily turned around too so I could kind of, uh, you know, have a bigger kind of workspace to uh, drill all the holes with. So that kind of, that helped a little bit uh, with the time, but it still was a very time-consuming process to drill 100 holes in plastic because it's like it gets caught in the plastic and I, I think I broke a couple pieces of plexiglass trying to do it and so I was going to airbrush the the back art so I ended up uh, I don't know if this is hard oh you can see it okay so I cut all these vinyl stencils out um, from my friend's vinyl cutter and then kind of had this whole plan like about it's was four colors, so I had to kind of like, okay, how am I going to do this where I got to peel off the right stencil and then airbrush a layer and then uh, put it back and then airbrush the next layer. And so this was the stencil. This is all ready to go, ready to be airbrushed. Um, and I, every step of the way, I was so concerned because one, you know, it was such a time-consuming process that if I would mess up one step along the way, I'd have to, it was ruined everything up to then. So I have to like redrill all the holes and do everything from scratch again. So I was very meticulous in the process of, uh, of creating this prototype. So this is the final uh, version of the back where it's airbrushed and it's got just the, you know, it's pretty rough on the back, just the Arduino Uno and still the breadboard on the back as well. And so this is the final uh, front piece that, um, if you've seen it, this is probably the version you've seen. And what's here now is the prototype for the uh, the 10 limited editions that I'm um, in the process of making. So once I realized that there might be a market for these, and you know, I probably had at Maker Fair had a, people coming up to me asking if it was for sale, and kind of like, okay, I should just I should just do this, and you know, this would be a fun job to have if I could actually turn this into a into a business and you know, make a bunch of these kind of different weird games. So I was like, okay, I'll make a 10 limited edition run of these. Um, I kind of priced it at 700 bucks each, uh, not really knowing what I was getting myself into, and. Uh, so started to take pre-orders just to kind of get us, uh, you know, a little bit of money to buy supplies and um, just to kind of, you know, feel like it's like, okay, people want to pay for this, so there might be a real market for it. And I wanted to add some new features to it as well. Um, so the infinity mirror inside the, the eye, which I really liked from the wormhole actualization machine, just... I like that kind of depth that it gave to it and do an extended wind cycle and add backlighting to it like old pinball machines and wanted to do a custom circuit board uh, because it was just breadboarded before and there was a couple times when like a wire came out and it stopped working and it was like what's going on and so you know I wanted to make it like a, a really solid product that uh, people would see as kind of you know they spent 700 bucks on and it's you know pretty robust and uh, can handle a little more uh, uh, kind of hard pushing than than the current one, and so and then screen printing the artwork because the I didn't want to airbrush this again. It was just a mega pain, and a uh, oft requested uh, volume knob on it because it's sometimes the sound gets a little 
loud and annoying. So this was kind of the original concept for the circuit board. Uh, and this is kind of before backlighting. It was super simple. And I was like, OK, this is pretty easy. I can, you know, I've never done circuit uh, board design. Uh, so I kind of had to dive into that world of uh, uh, KiCad and learning that, which ended up taking a lot of time because it's way more complex than I was expecting. Um, so I started to just do some prototyping of the, the circuit board and um, how the infinity mirror would work. and you know, to kind of get a sense of building the circuit board. You know, that's kind of like the first step of building a circuit board is breadboarding and kind of getting all your components down and uh, your connections and everything. And then from there, um, I had the idea of doing the backlighting, uh, which I think would add a lot of, like the old pinball machine, just kind of like the, the attract cycle, where it's just kind of sitting there kind of blinking uh, backlights. So I ended up adding uh, double the size of the circuit board wanting to do backlighting uh, because of uh, it was 16 LEDs that were added. So each LED had a resistor to it. And then there were three uh, banks of lights for the tester luck, uh, beat the odds, and one in 100 wins. Um, so each of those were just going to be on and off, uh, you know, kind of as part of the uh, attract cycle. So each one needed a MOSFET, which are those three large looking things, the black rectangles. Um, so that totally doubled the size of my circuit board. Um, so this is my schematic of the circuit board after doing the breadboard. And so that, that bottom half is just the backlighting effects. Um, and then this is the actual circuit board design after doing the um, uh, schematic where you import it into the KiCad and then start drawing all your lines and, you know, kind of making it all fit. And I wanted to make the circuit board, you know, a pleasing, visually attractive circuit board too. So I spent a lot of time just trying to lay out the components, you know, in a way that where they, you know, the, the most compact layout but also make it look good enough that, you know, it's kind of in itself a, a piece of art. Uh, so this was the final circuit board with all the components. And KiCad's totally amazing. It's like a, it has a little 3D uh, visualizer on it, so you can actually spin it around and see your circuit board, um, you know, almost like it's what it's going to look like, hopefully. Um, so I sent this off to uh, PCBWay, and it was, I was totally shocked that, I mean, getting 20 of them was like 25 bucks. And it's like, is that 25 each? Or like, that doesn't make sense that, you know, these are screen printed, they're, you know, two layers and, you know, they come back in a week and they're just like beautiful. Uh, so sure enough, a week later, they come DHL, uh, you know, totally beautiful looking and, you know, really, uh, uh, Mickey Delp, who was on the hardware panel last year, referred me to them and so, I don't think he's here, but I appreciate his uh, his help on this. Um, so then I kind of went into PCB production mode with my soldering iron and had to, you know, I did about, I had to do 10, I did 12 uh, of these soldered together and it ended up taking about eight hours to do all 12 boards. It is kind of very, uh, very zen-like uh, procedure. So this was the first uh, kind of plugging everything in and hoping everything works. That being my first PCB, and it's like, I don't even know if this is really going to work. And soldering everything was, you know, it's like you don't know if you're going to, you know, there's a certain threshold that all the components have where they'll just burn up if you solder them too long. So everything worked. I was super excited that I didn't mess anything up on my, my PCB design. Uh, so then I, yeah, kind of sat down and just soldered all of these resistors and all the components onto the... Uh, the board, and it turns out PCB Way does have a service that they'll do this for you. But I was, I'm kind of a glutton for a Zen punishment, so I just went ahead and went for it. So, um, and then I made a bunch of wiring harnesses. You know, I, I want to make this very, a very robust product, uh, even though it was, at this point I was getting in way over my head, both in time and money. But I. I I, I couldn't really stop at this point because it's just I had invested so much into it and I'd already pre-sold everything with the expectation that it was going to be, you know, this kind of grand uh, product. And so, um, so with the screen print of the design, um, you know, decided to do the backlighting, which turned out to be another additional hassle because of the, in a lot of the old pinball machines, uh, they would screen print on glass and then do this kind of foil uh, opaque mask on the back and then that would be uh, you know the lights would be behind that and I didn't really want to get in too deep in doing this because I was like this is going to be a pain in the butt to have to have this big vinyl stencil and then line it up with the artwork that's screen printed and 
ended up going through a few different screen printers and finally found a company who would work with me and just kind of see if they could get. The big thing was that the black had to be opaque enough to mask out the the lights that were behind it. So we did probably a half a dozen tests of trying to get a good solid black and they ended up doing, when they were screen printing it, they just did five continual passes of black. So they would do a black screen, dry it, do another black screen and just kind of like lay it on just to kind of get a, a really thick opaque black. And it totally worked. I was super excited but it took, a, you know, they ended up charging three times as much because of the extra labor and I was like well I, I got to do it at this point so a lot of this was just kind of I would get so far down a, a path that I just had to continue on it uh, so just did yeah typical screen print on plastic uh, and you know made the screens and color separations um, so here are the final uh, 10 screen printed artworks and then had the holes laser cut which I wasn't going to do my drill press trick again because that was another pain in the butt but laser cut you know ended up taking like 30 minutes it's like what it's like that i spent like five hours doing this before <laughs> um and another big issue that i had was sourcing leds um the previous supplier i i just had a bunch of issues just quality with quality control like as you can see on here there's all these like bent pixels and you know these are meant for outdoor uh, led signs so they're typically be behind um you know plastic facing backlight artwork and so they're not the best looking you know for what I was looking for where mine are just stuck into the plastic so I probably ordered same thing like probably a half dozen suppliers from AliExpress um, and wait a week for them to come and it's like I hope these are good you know and then get them and they're just like you know the they're dipped in resin so they weren't aligned right and some of the flanges on them were just kind of like they wouldn't hold into the plastic holes so eventually I found a supplier that provided the LEDs without uh, the silicone molding. <clears throat> so I ended up, it's was like, okay, this would be good because I can not worry about, you know, the, the uh, quality of the, of the molds, but now I have to get uh, mounts for these. So I ended up finding these 10 millimeter LED mounts and had to like hand uh, install them onto each LED and then poke them into the hole. And, you know, that would take two hours each, um, you know, each actual eye of the pyramid. So, and then uh, the actual pyramid on top became a whole other issue too because I was like, okay, I found, I happened to stumble upon this one at Goodwill, you know, the paperweight. And it's like, surely there's a bunch of these on eBay or something, you know, like the scorpions inside because I would cut off the bottom and then kind of sand it to give it a, uh, you know, translucency to kind of reflect the light a little better. And looked online, like different awards uh, companies that did trophies and these kind of their loose side awards and, you know, looking at the pyramid awards, but they ended up being like 30 bucks a piece, you know, without even having any kind of like engraving on it. So then I found like, oh, I can just make my own with a mold and uh, get acrylic resin and just, you know, do my own. And learned a bunch of stuff on... Uh, there's this whole kind of uh, hobby of building, you know, these kind of uh, acrylic molds and they put, you know, different like rocks in them and stuff. And so there's this whole forum and websites and stuff around, you know, molding, doing your own acrylic molds and, uh, uh, you know, polycarbonate and versus acrylic resins. And so I got way down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out how to do this mold and ended up commandeering my toaster oven into my shop to uh, preheat the mold and you couldn't do it on a humid day because the uh, acrylic reacts with humidity and it would bubble and it was just a total pain in the ass to make all these 12 molds. I have to like wait for the right day to, to do it with the right temperature and you know because otherwise it would yellow or get bubbly and uh, so it was quite an additional fiasco. So and then I was building the frames. The you know each one I wanted to make a uh, keep the same uh, you know wood kind of look. Uh, and the original one was made from reclaimed lumber that I had uh, old fence panels. And I tried to source that amount of wood again. You know that was good enough to uh, to use as a you know the actual frame. Eventually just bought new wood and uh, stained it. Uh, so it was just kind of a, you know, for about a week I was just kind of in production mode, factory milling and uh, sawing and uh, sanding all the different uh, panel pieces of wood and then stained it and, uh, and then uh, resined, uh, acrylic sealed uh, each of them. So this was all 10 of them all ready for uh, install of the electronics. 
Um, and then making the little pyramid boxes for the uh, Infinity Mirror. Um, this was kind of my initial just kind of test of, uh, you know, having a mirror and then a two-way mirror on the front. Uh, and then I cut a bunch of vinyl um, eyeballs to stick onto the mirror. So this was just kind of my, just a little stickers made. And then, so I had the same kind of thing. I had to make 10 of these. Actually, I'm making 12 of everything just for uh, one for me and then one for Chris. Uh, so was just kind of in factory production mode on each uh, part of the process. Um, and then made mounts for all. These are LED mounts for the backlighting. And so I kind of built this entire kind of piece that was the, the backlight mirror with the... Uh, uh, or the infinity mirror with the, the backlight LEDs attached to it that I can just kind of stick on the back of the entire uh, thing. And it was like this kind of module that I could stick into each one. Um, these are the same, the mounts for the lower uh, backlighting. Um, and then machined a bunch of washers for like vo the volume knob mounts in the uh, power connector um, to the wood. And so this is just a, uh, kind of combining all of those pieces together in my shop. Um, and so this was kind of like the first moment of truth of actually putting everything together. And as the first, you know, kind of initial prototype of the limited editions. Uh, and I realized the problem that I had was with the LEDs, they were, they, they were high intensity LEDs. And I had the issue of the light bleed um, now kind of coming from, you know, the black looks great. The black was totally opaque, but it's like, oh no, the, the yellow and the red uh, passes were just kind of one uh, pass on the color. And so I was getting uh, light bleed from, uh, from the LEDs. So this, my solution was to make these, you can kind of see them in the, in the corners, those kind of swan shaped uh, pieces. They were, I built these kind of like foam core kind of blocks to kind of uh, go behind the, uh, you can kind of see them here around the backlight. So I painted the, uh, that clear plastic black to kind of get the re reflective light that was coming off the back of the artwork and then built these kind of uh, just blocks to mask off the, um, you know, the, those ray shapes um, from getting light. And it, it worked pretty well. There's a little bit of light bleed, but it's not enough to really, I'm not going to go back and change anything at this point. So this was the the final back of it um, with all the LEDs in and the um, the backlight in the infinity mirror and the electronics. Um, so everything's now before the power supply was outside. So I wanted to kind of bring everything inside. So it was just the the power cable coming out, and then the circuit board is down there in the uh, next to the speaker in the lower corner. So this was the uh, the final version. Pretty much what. Um, you see down in the arcade, if anybody recognizes it's looking a little different, it's the uh, prototype for the limited edition that's here. Um, so yeah, it was quite a process and you know I like the way it turned out. There's a few little quirks that I um, that I found along the way, but you know not enough to kind of disrupt the production, but it was just kind of a very tedious process. Um, and there's just some shots of the um, now the, in the new infinity mirror and the uh, speaker cover and our claw machine plate. And this is the, uh, the pyramid up top and the new volume knob. So kind of looking back at all this that, um, you know, I should have really prototyped the new uh, limited edition version first to kind of get an idea of what, because I was kind of excited about doing the, uh, the production and started to take pre-orders really not doing any kind of uh, not knowing that I was going to do the backlighting in the infinity mirror. So what I should have done just to get a, get a sense of the time that it would take, uh, you know, I should have done the prototype of the with the infinity mirror and the backlighting first to really get a sense of what I was getting myself into. But also, you know, I, I appreciate the ability to learn new skills and, you know, whether or not I'm probably ever going to do acrylic molding again, probably not, but uh, like learning KiCad, the circuit design software was something that was definitely overkill for what I needed, but it's also something I wanted to learn just for future projects and, you know, it's definitely one of the most professional grade uh, circuit design tools out there at open source. Oh. Totally uh, uh, amazing community behind it um, and it's dense, but you know, it definitely does does the job really well, and just kind of enjoy the process. Like I like working in my shop, and 
you know, I liked the the process as much as the the you know the finished product. Um, you know, so anytime I get to spend in my shop and not programming databases is definitely uh, a benefit, positive for me. Um, so that's it. That's uh, got two out of the pyramids left. I've pre-sold eight of them, and my dad, who is here, I uh, shout out to my parents who drove all the way from Houston to come to the panel, and my dad patiently waiting for his number seven. <laughs> so uh, it's coming soon. I've got six done. So uh, you know, totally uh, been out there. Um, uh, there's six, yeah, in out in the wild. Um, so yeah, that was my experience in building the ten I the pyramids and. I'd like to, I mean, 700 bucks is my ideal price point. You know, I'd like to turn this into uh, making more of these kind of games. So, and that's my kind of ideal price point where I think it's accessible. And I think people appreciate these kind of simplified games. And it kind of goes back to Gordon's uh, Dow quote about, you know, filling your bowl too, too much and it spills over. I'm definitely into I'm like a thimble sized bowl, you know, keep it like totally bringing it down to the roots of, of gaming and, you know, kind of what, uh, kind of what that means to people. So uh, I think Eye of the Pyramid definitely boils that down to its, you know, the game, the essence of gameplay and just kind of like luring you in, you know, you see the lights there and it's just people, people keep playing it and that's why I think Vegas is, makes so much money too, so. Well, let's give Alan a big round of applause. Thank you, Amazing. thanks for coming. So um, we'll have time for questions at the end, so um, please keep all of your questions in mind. And we're going to switch over. Uh, perfect. Yeah, cool. Good. Oh, there we go. And next up, we got Andy Raitano. Take it away. Hey. Uh, my name's Andy Raitano. I'm from New York City. And uh, if you want to follow my website or my Twitter handle, I've been doing a lot of console development lately. And if you don't want to do that and you want to contact me over ham radio, here's my call sign. Um, this was my, my first computer. It was a Commodore 64, uh, very common microcontroller, uh, a 6502 derivative. Uh, it was in the Apple II, the NES, uh, let's see, well, BBC Micro, it, the list goes on. It's very, Apple IIe, right? Uh, very, very common microcontroller. And I had this machine. We found it in the garbage, and like the A key was popped out, uh, so we couldn't type load star uh, to <laughs> load a disk. Uh, but it had Maniac Mansion in there. Uh, which was, you know, a prototypical point-and-click adventure, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I, I just kind of fell in love with the game, and this was my first start in the coding. So I started to write Zork-like uh, text adventures. And when I wanted to try to actually put graphics on the screen and scroll the play field, I found BASIC to be too slow. So I started to learn 6502 assembly. And what was nice about that is the microcontroller was so cheap and so common is that I can transfer those skills to things like uh, the NES. And I got my start in electronics uh, in basically in like, you know, punk metal scene where I just wanted to make the craziest guitar pedal I could and I really couldn't afford to buy a vintage, you know, 80s pedal. So there's communities online uh, to that provide PCB layouts so you can clone these pedals and make them at home. So if you see, on, there's like this pool of acid on, on the left and I totally mess up my sink and lose my safety deposit uh, on my apartment. Uh, but I started etching my own pedals at home for uh, my friends and, and, and bands and my own uh, music. So these are some of the designs that I had made. Uh, there's my friend Zach on, you know, it's so fun to, I loved, I immediately fell in love with this idea of like a DIY scene where I could just put my friend's face on the back of a, a guitar pedal. And the first one I designed was called a neck ringer. It was like a ring modulator. It's the guy like choking the other guy on the over there. Uh, and so we'd host these house shows. I think that's me in a white shirt on the right there. Uh, and it, it was just so much fun to try to build and experiment with these things. And I, I kind of instantly, you know, stopped caring less about the music and more about the, the creativity and the production that goes into a, a scene. Uh, here's a picture of me <laughs> when I couldn't grow a beard and I could shred on guitar, and now it's the other way around. Uh, <laughs> uh, so when that scene kind of collapsed, like all punk scenes do, uh, I started seeking that, that DIY feel, and I found it in the chip music scene, uh, which are people who are like-minded, who are like creating music and, and video art on these old consoles. So there's just some clips here of 
some of the visualizations I had done. So I started transferring my skills as a computer programmer and electronics designer into uh, bringing this, this visual show to a stage. So I'm only invoking the video chip. I'm not trying to write a game, even though I do have uh, you know, some fond memories of these games. It's not really what it, it was about for me. I didn't want to make an, I can't make a game like Mega Man 2. I don't, I have no interest in it. Um, it would take me the next four years and it probably wouldn't be as, as solid. So I started uh, pulling away the aesthetics and pieces that I really cared about with the console. And the NES uh, came out in 1985. Uh, it has that 6502 microprocessor with running at a blazing fast 1.79 megahertz. And uh, that's two kilobytes RAM. And I used to always say it all in my talks for the youngs, that's like 16 tweets, but it's actually more like eight tweets with Unicode. And now it's like four with the double <laughs> limits. So I got to update my slides. Uh, so I ended up working on my first like game for a console. And I really don't, con I mean, I consider it a game, but it's, it was really more of a, uh, like a shared experience, like a video board game. It was called Super Russian Roulette. And I brought it here two years ago thinking no one would give a shit. And a lot of people did, and it was really fun. And there was emergent behavior that I didn't. It it, uh, it uses the Zapper uh, light gun, and it probably is exactly what you think it is. Uh, uh, it's a game for three players, and it, it plays out, like I said, more like a video board game than a, a Twitch action game. So you, the players end up looking at each other as much as they look at the screen. You know, if the cowboy loses, it just goes dead silent there's no music and everyone just has to stare at each other and i love it it's really a strange uh kind of cathartic experience for some people they're like oh we win and the game doesn't end it's just it's just there and they're like oh shit like oh yeah we have to keep playing uh and then uh the following oh, that year i had met zach johnson who's a developer from minneapolis and we'd worked on a project called nest specter which is outside uh if you want to go play with it i think we have this yeah i have the contra cart there and basically democratized the RAM of an NES console, allowing uh, people on a, on a cell phone to manipulate a, a game while someone's playing. So if someone thinks they're really good at Contra, you kind of like knock them down a peg and, uh, <laughs> and, and take that away from them. So last year, uh, in response to Super Russian Roulette, I st started amping up my production. And I uh, formed a company called BatLab Electronics. And I was designing cartridge hardware for people like me, who want to write my own, write your own homebrew software for these consoles to do so. So I, I have these cartridges that, and this was um, these are the Gerber files on the bottom right. These kind of neon things, and uh, what Alan was talking about, where you can send out those source files and get those PCBs back. You can design circuits, and they're so cheap. I use PCB way too, by the way. I was going to applaud for that, uh, and. You know, the idea wasn't to be able to make reproductions of popular games. It was so that I could provide development tools for people to release their own games cheaply, and me being the first customer. Uh, and here's just some of the designs. I'd worked with a band called Anamanaguchi who wrote music on their on their cartridges, and that was the first hundred that were off the line. Uh, here's here's a clip of some of the development tools. On the top left is like a flasher. So if you think of like a USB floppy drive and you would put a floppy disk in this is like a usb cartridge reader writer and you could put the cartridge in and you could rewrite them you know multiple times and this was most recently the super russian roulette production house and uh, you can see on the top left we had a setup to meet demand uh gang programmer so you know you have like five going at once with this um display so you can each one's connected to a raspberry pi which is like an embedded device really cheap linux computer and uh, this way we can do five at a time because we, we had to do 1,500 and they take minutes to program and it would have been the rest of my life. Uh, so we just kind of got smart about it. But, you know, creating these challenges for myself and meeting them is, is kind of what, what I live for uh, anymore. But like a lot of people are like, why would you develop for a console from 1985? Or why in the hell would you <laughs> develop for a 30-year console? You know, something that came out a year after I was born. And I want to argue that it's not just nostalgia. It's, it's not to make the game you loved. It's, it's to explore hardware, explore um, developer mindset in you know, a, a, a past era of development. And there's a technical challenge involved. And it sounds like a bad thing. Like you know, if I whine about 
there being two kilobytes of RAM. I, I, I know it sounds bad, but I, I think working within constraints and limitations makes you a better developer or artist or, you know, choosing a palette or um, confining yourself to a sound set. Like, this is the scariest thing in the world to me. Like, I've, <laughs> you know, in the past few days, I've, I've been blown away by, by watching uh, these panels and seeing what people do with this. But for me, I'm crippled with anxiety. And I'm sure everyone has been. I can, you can do anything. You can drop in any PNG, any MP, you drop an uncompressed file, a, it, you know, OGGs, whatever you want to do, you can put in here. And you may be a great programmer that doesn't really make you a great game designer. Or I, I kind of needed personally something to guide my hand. I needed to work within constraints and see how far I can push uh, my video game. And developers did it all the time. You're looking at every tile that appears in Super Mario Brothers, every single one. And if you remember the experience, for those who have played, you're like, there's a title screen, and then you're above ground, and you go into a castle, and you go underground, and now it's dark, and you get all the way to the ends, and now you're underwater, and now you're fighting a boss in this like lava castle, and you know, it, this is every tile that makes up the game. It's eight kilobytes of of tile data and you know there's a pretty common trope that I always bring up where people say oh mind blown the clouds are the same as the bushes they just repainted them green uh, you can see them I don't know can you see my mouse pointer oh yeah you can see them right up here so really clever tile reuse to to fit within those constraints they're actually so efficient that on the bottom right here you see like this garbage it's it's actually map data for the screen they're like oh you know data is data we can just put it in the the video RAM, um, or video ROM. So you can see that down here. Also clever use of the score to extend the digits for when you like defeat an enemy and your, your score goes up. So really incredible um, approach and, and driven by these constraints. So here's like a, a Zelda hand-drawn uh, tile map for fairly popular game. But is this the work of a programmer, or is this the work of a, an artist? And I, I couldn't tell you for sure. So you know, if you look right here, if, I don't know if you could read it, but if it's like Battleship, it's, this is two here and this is eight. So you see this like half a tunic and half a heart. They were taking advantage of the fact that you can flip tiles uh, horizontally, mirror them, to use up less video data. Um, same thing with this, uh, you know, the, I said the potion, the heart, the key. You can even see there's like two parts of the key. So now they have like the the head of the key and then the actual, I don't know, I don't know key parts, <laughs> the end of the key, uh, the teeth, teeth. Uh, but now it can be rotated in any direction with these three tiles because you can flip this one uh, vertically, flip this one horizontally. So it can appear in any direction. Uh, here's like half a fairy and then half a Yoda looking, oh, I think it's the old man. I think it's the old man from the game. And you know it's a level playing field. You don't you don't have different video cards. You don't have different processors. And you know this one doesn't have eight gigs of RAM. It's an NES. You know with some exceptions of cartridge hardware, it's pretty much a level playing field. So now if you take this and you compare it to Super Mario, which was a great game, uh, this is really cinematic, right? Look on the left. You know for a console with only one background layer and one sprite layer, they're doing this parallax scrolling on these clouds to give this illusion of depth while using the advantage, um, the fact that you could put sprites in front of that layer to create this tower. So it's like looming in the distance. It really looks like it. And then this, even this little flapping bandana. And like on the right, you can see like all this grass is kind of moving. And it it doesn't really make sense, but it looks awesome, right? <laughs> like and like it, it really doesn't make any sense, but it looks cool. And uh, this is one of, actually, I, I went to go find this GIF and I ended up on Rachel Wilde's site and I ripped it from there. But this is very um, clever use of, of tile manipulation to make it look like there's this rotating column, this tower. And it's just kind of otherworldly and it's because of a clever developer, not, they didn't throw money at it, they threw time and creativity. And same thing with sound design, you know, a lot of people are very fond of the bleepy bloopiness of an NES. Um, but if you imagine that you had, you know, there's five sound channels, if you had like five musicians and they all had the same instruments to choose from, uh, you know, if there were five completely different musicians, you'd expect something a bit different, you'd expect a different range of talent. You know, how they would manipulate these 
these objects to create sound. So I don't know if my sounds, oh great. So there's two square waves, um, a triangle wave, a noise channel, and uh, a sample channel. So these two songs are the exact same hardware. And while this song is, is beautiful and it's got a great melody, um, and just as an aside, I rented Pictionary, which is a like a crappy port of an already sort of boring game. And I put it in and uh, I turned it on and I went to my friends, I'm like, you have to play Pictionary. And they, they pretty much told me to piss off. But now I get to prove uh, what a great soundtrack it has. Same hardware. Pictionary fucking rips. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> It's like, I remember turning on being, I just sat at the title screen and I was like, oh, I can't believe it. Um, <laughs> I, I, all right, I'll, that's enough. Uh, so I, <laughs> we could listen after. Uh, but you know, it's the same exact sound hardware. The only difference was uh, development time and, and maybe the clever composer. Um, and for Super Russian Roulette, we wanted to convey how do you convey a theme with such simple sound synthesis? Uh, for us, we said, oh, we want like a, a Morricone, Ecstasy of Gold, Good, Bad, and the Ugly type Western soundtrack. So how do you do that with four channels? We only used four of the five channels. We're like, all right, we'll make one square wave, like a whistle. You have to have a whistle, right? Another one, like a strumming guitar, a triangle just as a bass, and the noise like a shuffling, like you're on a trail, right? So I'm going to isolate. This video will isolate the channels and play out. So it's just the bass line on the triangle channel. Here's the shuffling, like you're on the old tr dusty trail. Guitar. And a very clever vibrato applied to the uh, square channels sound like a whistle, right? So, you know, again, uh, the person who had worked on that, my friend Nick Gargiulo, who's an extremely talented composer and musician, had never worked on a, uh, an NES game in his life. He'd never written in a tracker, which is the music, he, uh, the program he used to compose this type of music. And it's a very um, programmatic way of thinking. It's like you're programming the music. And he just knocked it out of the park because he was put in this box and he had to rethink the fact that he couldn't use any VST in his, his digital workstation. He had to make it work within it and it kind of kind of forces charm it's in a strange way there's also a part of it that i'm really interested in which is digital archaeology because not everything is known you know companies shut down and they like all that stuff goes to a scrapyard or a, a burn they just burn all the file cabinets you know there's a lot of stuff that's lost to time and i don't want to be too corny like oh there's a message in a bottle or a cave painting but there's a lot of stuff hidden in the memory of these games. So I'd written a tool that I ran on some ROM sets that would look for uh, common strings that, uh, or text blocks that may necessarily never, could never be activated in the game. So did you know that uh, on the, if you, who here has played Donkey Kong in like an arcade? Like a fair amount of people, but did you know that on one of these ROMs there's essentially a developer challenge. In the ROM, there's some text that can never be activated in the game, no matter how you make the, you know, jump man jump or, you know, how many points you get. And basically, they're like, hey, if you're poking around in our ROM data, we'd rather hire you than you clone our game. So this is like an original developer challenge. Uh, and you've played it, and you none of, maybe none of you knew that. And this is one of my favorite ones. I'd spoken at Nerd Night Austin <laughs> some years back. And uh, yeah, I mean, actually, <laughs> we had spoken about this and you know it was a I'm pretty sure it was a it turned out to be a jab at a manager uh, who was riding some developer and he said Jeff Spangenberg is a weenie and what I love about it is uh, after that there was I found some block of text in an interview and this had become a popular thing and uh, it was like after a few more rounds of comments to include him standing directly in front of me he said go ahead and hit me I can use the money like and it's like I've revealed this story through that. But I, I always think the ultimate revenge is that 
baked in some silicon and thousands of copies is your name. You are a weenie. Like it's sitting in at, at probably a game over game, so you can go over it and like that's living in a chip somewhere. somewhere. And this is one of my favorites, uh, Matt Fresser Mariarty in the mod file. Hello, hacker planker. This is Matt Furness. Here's the deal: if you hack this game, I will find you <laughs> wherever you are and break your legs, and that's a promise. So. So th there's a lot to explore other than just trying to make another platformer. Um, and it's a knowable design. You know, this is, I can name every chip in this motherboard. Uh, if I drop my phone, I can't tell you shit. It's, it's, it's a black box. But here, these, you can manipulate this, this console. You can desolder, you can replace, and you can look up data sheets. There's some, you can draw the schematic. You can reverse engineer the parts where, I won't say they're simple, but they're, they're knowable, right? And I, I guess I mentioned before how incredibly inspired I am every year uh, I come here. And I, I, so I went through some embarrassing like Dropbox files and, you know, old archives. And I was trying to figure out, you know, what motivates me. And I looked at my work since 2009. And the technical challenge is something that I've explored. But I really think at the end of the day, it's the spirit of collaboration and DIY and enabling people who want to do this crazy stuff also. So, you know, doing music and art compilations and live, you know, making live performance tools to invoke the audio chip and invoke the video chip. And uh, I think that stems from early days of playing in a band and solving those mysteries and, and figuring out how the thing works. Um, and in invoking my electrical knowledge to create these what if peripherals and accessories that would have never existed. Um, you know, Nintendo would have never released a Russian roulette game, uh, but, but I can, and I can for my friends, and I can entertain them and, and bring them in and, and have them challenge themselves. So, you know, if it's me as a vessel, you know, busting ass on, on trying to figure out low-level assembly stuff so that my friends could use my tool and make pretty incredible music, I mean, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, and there's usually one thing about a project that that really excites me and that I, I want to achieve. And like I said, it's never to make Mega Man 2 again. I, I don't, I don't, I love the game, but I, I really don't I have no interest in in making it. Um, oh, this was in the the folders. This is <laughs> well, I realized how many tough guy photos we we have. Uh, uh, how much time do I? Like five-ish minutes. Okay, great. So I actually found a. Um, uh, I started building a folder of some of the projects that I'd worked on to try to um, reflect on, on on the work that I'd done. And, and I, there's things that I just had completely forgotten about. Um, this was a, a project that I'd worked on recently. Uh, it's a Sega CD uh, interactive media disc, right? So there's no game involved, but you're manipulating. It lets you press the buttons and create audio against my friend, uh, Christoph Richard. He plays his note. Uh, and, you know, I have a fondness for the Sega CD because they're just so gnarly and crappy. But, I, yeah, here's me dancing in hot Austin weather in a members-only jacket. Uh, but I, I wasn't interested at all in making a game. We made, like, a jam mode, so it's like two people can play Waka Flocka samples. You can hear it. But they're really talented. I couldn't do that, right? Anyway. Um, so, actually, I have a copy. Uh, and we'll give it away somehow after a couple of copies. Um, so, I'd worked on a project. The, one of the, my favorite "what if" peripherals, and what actually kind of launched me into this this scene, um, is a thing called Drunkenness, which was a cartridge with an alcohol sensor in it, and you plug it into port two, and you blow into it, and it would give you a score based on your uh, uh, blood alcohol. Oh, Emmy shot this video. Thanks, Emmy. I think so. Yeah, it's actually here. <laughs> so, um, actually, have some. Uh, oh, I, I wasn't going to show. It's really embarrassing. We can hear, like, it'll respond to the pitch. I have a little shot glass here. Uh, so it... <laughs> it 
and it would give you a ranking and you'd have a high score, which was really irresponsible, but it's really only for my friends, right? Um, and uh, let's see. I wanted to maybe open a ROM. Uh, actually, I'll open a local one for my friends run a um, wrestling organization in Austin called Party World Wrestling. I don't know if I... Hey, cool. So I'd done this, they had done this event called WrestleVania, and it's sort of video game themed. Um, so uh, a friend, Zeke, who's an incredible artist, he did my Super Russian Roulette manual art. I created all these gifts for WrestleVania, which is, like I said, this not Castlevania themed, but kind of vampire themed. Um, okay, all right. it's spooky. I don't know. Uh, so I created this ROM that you can play at, at the event, and you can walk up, and it had all uh, angles and arcs from the, the wrestling event. But my favorite part is my, my very good friend Jared plays this character who's like uh, a poacher, like a, he's a heel, right? So <laughs> there he is. And he's like this poacher character that like beats up on stuffed animals and everybody hates him. So I made like this infinite runner uh, type game. And uh, Zeke did an incredible job because when he, I hope I can get to a part if they don't botch this. So yeah, his thing is like he's cruel to animals and there's a six digit score, which I love because there's no way anyone can get there. I borrowed that from, Blind. oh shit. Yeah. Your rank, wombat. Uh, it doesn't matter what score you get. It just gives you a random animal, like a kookaburra or something. So it's the kind of stuff, like I said, I, I am not motivated in doing something for myself. It's always with people that inspire me for what they do. Like uh, we, uh, Natalie Lawhead and uh, Rachel Weil and I, we started working on this like mystic. We did this. We started this what Friday? Oh yeah. It's like. Mystic smartphone, uh, not smartphone, mystic like telephone that would spit out these fortunes to you. And you know, I can invoke the video chip and do these crazy kind of palette cycling effects just by virtue of how the hardware works. And I know glitch is such a hot aesthetic right now, but this is actually like I'm actually destroying the VRAM. It's almost effortless in, in on a console because that's the way it was. I don't have to download a shader or anything crazy like that. But I'm really excited about this. We uh, we sketched up a bunch of stuff. Um, in spirit of Fantastic Arcade, we always, you know, a lot of people collab and meet here. It's how Ness Spectre was born. It's just kind of a magical thing. I'm really excited about this because the, the, the Sega, the, the sound chip is so gnarly and it lends itself so well to like a, a ringing telephone and corruption and things like that. Um, and I think it's probably, I mean, I have another video. Do I have any more time? It's okay if I'm out. One more. Let's, one more. Let's see one more. Which one? Uh, the best one. Uh, there's no way. Uh, no pressure. Telefuture. Telefuture or... Okay, cool. This is something. Uh, Telefuture is a label my friend Steve Jenkins runs. Um, uh, and we had done this compilation card. Again, you know... Telefuture. Facilitating uh, musicians to be able to to put their music on a cartridge and write within those constraints. So some very good friends of mine, and with all respect to Brady, I'm going to play his song. So these are just like these little vignettes that you can go around and we made it like a, um, uh, I made it like a TV menu, like an OSD. And I'm like, so, you know, detail obsessed that like, I made sure I timed, if you see on the top right, um, there's like the, the the channel. It goes away at the right time. I counted on my Sony Trinitron. Um, but the the one thing I cared about is uh, a good friend of mine, Chris, in Melbourne, Australia. We wanted to make like a wow track. So I developed the hardware to allow you to have eight megabytes of ROM, which is I think eight times the largest game commercial game that came out. So we could do dumb stuff like this. I'm gonna have to frame skip. So it's a fully voiced track with, with lyrics um, using some DAC tricks on the Sega. So combining FM synthesis and the Yamaha chip on the Sega, like right here, like, that's not a sample. And then it goes back to his vocals. So he wrote lyrics over an FM track and we just want people to open up and be like, what the hell is this, right? And that's, that's, the, that's the kind of thing I, uh, I, was, I was after. Uh, this, this is the board uh, that, and the flasher for, for those uh, cartridges. Um, but you know, like I said, I, I, I can't stress enough that, that the people you surround yourself with will, 
will will make you want to do these things and will will make you passionate about uh, your own work. Um, and that's why I, I really love uh, coming here. Uh, so I, I have a couple things to give away. I guess we did there in Q and A. Uh, yeah. Do uh, why don't we first of all let's give a round of applause for Andy Ritano. And we've got a couple minutes for questions real quick, and then um, maybe we can do the giveaway, I don't know. Let's, let's reconvene. Yeah, will figure it out. Well, maybe we can throw it in Starcade or something. I'm gonna, I'll, meet, I'll meet with my, yes, Wiley gave me thumbs up. I feel confident about Sounds that. We'll, we'll, we'll throw it in Starcade. Um, so uh, since I have the mic, I want to ask a quick question of both of you guys, and then I'll take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so one thing that strikes me about both of your work, and I think that's something that I really love about the work that both of y'all do, is how multidisciplinary it is. You know, we saw screen printing, we saw <laughs> etching, we saw drills being mounted upside down. Um, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about, like, what, how did you, did you learn all of these skills from other parts of your life? Did you, I mean, Alan, did you used to work at a screen printing business? Did you learn these, or did you learn these things for a specific project? Did you say, hey, I need to learn how to airbrush, so I'm going to do that, so I can build this thing. Oh, I need to learn how to mount LED lighting. Like, yeah, how does that work had, for both of you? I always had kind of like little snippets of, yeah, I used to airbrush as a kid, and uh, so I had some uh, experience in airbrushing, but never on plastic. And, you know, I think that's definitely been... Uh, a motivation for me kind of throughout my life is just kind of learning new skills and ways to build things and uh, the internet's been great. I mean, I'm a, probably, I consider my Google skills to be pretty good so I can really like fine tune my, what I'm searching for. And there, it's amazing just what you find Googling if you know how to like craft the search terms and you know, it's just, it's almost like everything's been answered and it's out there and it's just, you have to know how to find it. And so I think for me, it's just kind of this, uh, I just have this constant thirst for learning skills and having a, I've got a big shop now and I've got room to get new tools. So I'm always kind of like, well, I'll use this at some point in the future. And I've always kind of embraced new skills by a, kind of accepting a big project. You know, somebody asked me if I can do this thing and I was like, sure, I'll figure it out. You know, it's just, I don't think I'd hesitate about, uh, you know, kind of wanting to learn new things and just, embracing you know the possibility of, of kind of expanding my knowledge base and it's like yeah this will lead to other stuff and who knows if it'll be you know something worthwhile but I'd rather just learn it myself and see where it where I end up going with it yeah it's pretty much the same thing uh, you know once I fulfill that I kind of want to move on but I also get some kind of like skill envy like I just watching your talk like if you think I didn't want to pop the back off eye of the pyramid or wormhole <laughs> I uh, if you ever find a screw loose, it was probably me trying to get in there. Uh, you know, just looking at that going, oh, well, you know, a laser cut it, duh. You know, cool. That, that's, a, that's so smart. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's like the seeking that, that kind of, uh, you know, enough to make me feel like I know it and then kind of getting bored with it and, and moving on and knowing I can come back to it if I need. That's, that's a, a big part of drive for, for me. Hi guys, uh, thanks for showing this stuff. Um, it's all so incredible. Um, and I have a question for um, for both of you. So, you know, you showed uh, the Unity project earlier and how it like terrifies you. And um, I think you, you make a good point there about games now being so just like, like you, you can do anything. Um, and there's not quite this sort of like beautiful, like simplicity of um, working with these sort of like um, you know, digital or like electronic relics. Um, and do you think that we're losing anything with like modern games? And is there a way that we can get that sort of like quality back into, you know, contemporary games um, without having to like go back to the, the roots of the hardware? Uh, if, if I've learned anything from, from this festival is that you can draw inspiration from anything at all. And I think simplicity is found in, 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 you know, there's so many uh, games that involve aspects of nature or human personality or interpersonal relationships that I never even considered, and I find them far more fascinating than the stuff I'm doing. Um, so I think there will always be uh, great inspiration in, in op, you know, objects in, in just everyday life that you can pull from, and that will drive your your constraints and your limitations of what you're trying to achieve. Um, but as far as old 
you know, like these old video games, I, I you know, there, a lot of people will get a little annoyed if a game it's not completely, it's called retro style, but it's not completely obeying the, the constraints, like it's rotated a sprite, and it's like, God forbid, something like that happens, but I, some of my favorite games do that, so I don't care, <laughs> you know? So my favorite games rotate a sprite, and it, 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 it's not on a perfect angle, and the pixels sheer and stuff, but they're, they're still great. Um, I think the you can incorporate uh, those experiences. You know, people have virtual consoles. Some people still fall, you know, there are young people that still fall in love with old games and maybe will carry some inspiration from that. They're always, they're more available than ever. You know, those consoles go away, but emulation is, and I mean like commercial emulation even, like virtual console, this, you know, maybe this week Switch doesn't have anything, but they ported the Neo Geo golf game, uh, made it available for sale. And maybe someone would find something insp inspirational about that. Well, I love what you say about, you know, the creativity through limitations, which I'm definitely a big fan of. And, you know, I think that's human nature is to kind of, you have this void, you want to fill it with stuff. And you have these development tools like Unity where you have all these kind of options and you just want to like stuff it full. You want to like maximize your two gigabytes of memory you got. And, you know, so I think it's kind of a natural tendency to kind of want to maximize what you have and you know like in traffic modeling there's induced demand where it's like you build a bigger highway and you get traffic just filling up because it's just like you've got all this space now you know and i think that does apply to a lot of you know developers now where you just have this kind of unlimited palette of tools and you know you just feel like you're uh not using everything if you don't use it all and you know having to boil it down to something of a game essence is difficult now because you you're not really encouraged to right now uh, because you just have this unlimited uh, memory and, you know, that's kind of, we're pushing things more and more each time, you know, it's like we kind of want to one-up what we just did, so, you know, I think that's definitely can be a detrimental effect on um, games and yeah, kind of all sorts of different uh, aspects of our lives. So I think we're running a little short on time. I'm going to take one more question and then um, are y'all are willing to stick around uh, during the break if folks want to chat with you and ask more questions sure yeah sure all right I'll, cool I'll, I'll go out towards the nest specter set up if anyone wants to see that great right we have there. one more question so this is specifically for uh, Andrew, um, you mentioned uh, you know different chips and whatnot, and your sort of fondness for the 6502 because of it being your sort of first computer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of reminded me that one of my favorite synth chips is actually in the Genesis, and I'm not even a Genesis kid. I was a Nintendo person, but I've yeah. always loved that sort of grittiness of the Yamaha chip specifically sure. in the Gen. So my question is, have there been any systems that you developed for uh, either the video side, the uh, assembly side, or whatever that you don't have necessarily the same fondness for the 6502, but you seem to fall in love with just developing in them. Uh, well, I can tell you one I hate. That's, <laughs> oh, that's even better. Uh, the Sega CD add-on is a separate, is a, Sega Genesis 68K based, and the Sega CD is another 68K, and they're running at different clock speeds, and you need to, you need to orchestrate data transfer between the two. And in order to get my goofy ass dancing on the, the crunchy full motion video i had to like reverse engineer the cinepack codec which is like an archaic like mpeg2 derivative um and uh, you know we're, i'm over it i'll never do it again, uh, I, again but the, you know i i just rachel Weil has a, a, a bally astrocade i'd never seen one or i didn't know anything about it and this is totally bizarre alien console i've never seen i instantly fell in love with the fact that it, it's four player four player yeah four player 1977 was the year of release with a full frame buffer and like tons of colors and i'm like whoa it's like 77 you know nes came out eight years later and it's like where was i and it's like well number one i wasn't born number two we wouldn't have been able to afford it right it's a really expensive machine uh but even you know down in the aesthetic the, i would love to start developing for something like that just to see what i would find but like just know, just seeing what it can do, I'm like, oh, well, that's better than this, and this is worse than that, and there's so many trade-offs. And that's why I did a lot of the visual stuff on the Sega, is because like, I have two layers now, and now I can work with that. I thought I would do everything on the NES, and then I kind of outgrew it for for the visual stuff, just to keep it uh, interesting. But yeah, uh, no, I hate. I I mean, I answer your question. I just wanted to tell you I hated working on that project. <laughs> All right, good. All right, let's give another round of applause for our panelists. Very awesome, inspiring work. I'm going to go home, dick out all my Arduinos, and uh, make something half as, maybe a quarter is good.